Um, I, I wanted to talk to you about chronic pain today. And, and the reason for that is many of us, with or without scleroderma, have it. And so, particularly for you all, I think this is a very timely topic. I don't know whether you had a chance to talk to, to, to go to um, Sherwin Sassi's talk on musculoskeletal uh, pain, and I think that feeds in very nicely to what I'm going to be talking about. So he um, undoubtedly has a handout, so you might want to talk to, uh, might want to get one of those. So I'm going to be talking about chronic pain today. And here's what I'm going to talk about specifically. Anatomically defined pain, and then the other chronic pain. And there's a lot to talk about here. The genetics, what starts it, what's going on, and then finally, of course, how to treat it. What I'm not going to talk about, however, are certain aspects of pain. There's just not enough time. I'm not going to talk about transcutaneous nerve stimulation or acupuncture directly or epidural cord stimulation. All of these are for severe pain and sometimes are very important. And I'm not going to talk about the various ways drugs can be given, such as under the skin or into a vein or across the skin or in the mouth to get into the circulation that way. But I am going to talk about what's causing the pain. And you can see on this particular uh, figure that there are three areas. There's the anatomically defined pain. There's the pain that's associated with inflammation and auto-inflammatory diseases. And there's idiopathic pain. And I want you to look at this very carefully. First of all, see right there how much overlap there is? That in any one case, it's going to overlap with all of the others. So it's not always one pain or another pain. It's usually a combination of pains. And then, very importantly, look at the idiopathic pain syndromes. It's the largest part of this. And so it's very important to be aware of that. Now, there are lots of names for it. My preferred name is chronic pain. But some people call it fibromyalgia, or some people say um inflammatory, uh, sorry, um, bowel, bowel syndrome, um, inflammatory bowel syndrome, okay, sorry. But just so you know, if you go to your doctor and say, I've got fibromyalgia, you have automatically one strike against you. Don't do it. Call it something else. Seriously. Call it chronic pain. I don't care. It's real. But believe me, if you use the word fibromyalgia, you are done. OK? So don't do that. First of all, let's talk about mechanical wear and tear kinds of pain, muscle pains. What happens here is there's a problem in the top there. So there's a muscle or tendon tear. And what happens is that the nerves from that area go direct, directly to the spinal cord, and then it doesn't go up to the brain. It crosses over right at that level to a nerve that goes outside back to the muscle. So it's very different than the pain that goes up into the brain. It's fast, and it has a different way of functioning. And so, for example, there are Cervical nerve pains, that's the neck, and the nerve goes to the neck and right out. So what areas does the neck serve? Well, it affects basically the arms on both sides and the hands. So if you have neck pain, it's going to be out here. If it's the nerves in the middle of the back, it'll affect the chest muscles. If it's down in the lower part of the back, it'll get the legs. So it's local pain. And then, if it's down in the sacrum, it can get the bowel or the bladder, sexual function, those areas. So local pain. And what do we do for it? Well, for this kind of pain, non-steroidal drugs, Advil, naproxen, antihistamines, 
drugs like um, what are called SSRIs, which are things like Paxil and things of that sort. Drugs that are sometimes called anticonvulsants, gabapentin, Neurontin, Lyrica. And then, for the muscle spasm itself, antispasmodics, like Flexeril or its equivalents. So these are local pains, local therapies. What about autoimmune and inflammatory disorders like lupus and RA, things of that sort? The typical ones are SLE or scleroderma, osteoarthritis, and then our favorite area, the chronic low back, which all of us have, has nothing to do with scleroderma, but we all have it. It comes from going from on fours to standing up. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about that. When you talk about pain in scleroderma or lupus, 20 to 25% of the patients who have lupus or scleroderma or RA have other causes for their pain, like typical localized pain. So just because you have lupus and you have pain doesn't mean it's from lupus or scleroderma. And there's no correlation between the damage and the disease and the function. So an RA, where you all know you can get, or in scleroderma for that matter, but an RA, you know the fingers get really messed up at least as much, in fact, as in scleroderma, no relationship between how bad those fingers are and the pain. So there must be something else causing that pain. Well, some of it may be this disease. Tell me, anybody know what this disease is? This is a, a, a part of a finger. Osteoarthritis, exactly right. How do you know that? Because you see that extra bone area on the upper side there? I don't know if this is going to show, but I'll try. Right there. That's extra bone. It's typical of osteoarthritis. And the other thing that's typical of osteoarthritis is that cushion, the blue stuff, is partially gone. That cushion between the bones just goes away. It goes away unevenly, but it goes away. So you're talking about bone on bone, and then secondary increased bone to try and do something to keep those bones apart. And that's typical of osteoarthritis. Now, if you have knee pain, 10% of the people who have significant knee pain have normal x-rays. And about half of the patients with very severe osteoarthritis have no pain at all. Now, isn't that weird, right? And if you look at anxiety and depression, it doesn't account for it. So there's got to be more to the pain, just like in lupus, than the things we expect it to be. There's got to be more going on that explains that chronic pain. So. Let's talk about chronic low back pain next. So, again, one test of localized pain, you can try it on yourselves. Push down on your thumb, hard, not just a little, but hard. It hurts, okay? So this is a typical way to test if there's peripheral pain going on. And so if you press real hard, and try and correlate that with low back pain, 33% of the time it, it helps explain it. So typical peripheral pain doesn't explain it. Again, there must be more going on than just the anatomic pain. So we want to talk about non-anatomic pain. So how big is this problem? Well. If you look at this, and the bottom says there's more and more tenderness as you move from your left to your right. And you look at the normal population, and you can see that in the normal population, there are a fair number of people who have a lot of tenderness. Okay? So that 
the normal population has a lot of tenderness, not just scleroderma patients. So you happen to be a normal patient, a person, who also has scleroderma. So you, the normal part of you, whatever that is, is going to have some tenderness in many cases. And it turns out that if you go to a bunch of totally normal people and press on their tender points, 50% of them have tender points. Okay? So it's normal to have some of that pain. Okay? And it's not unusual to say, all right, look, I've got some pain, I'll live with it. And I'm sure you all do some of that. And that's appropriate because sometimes it's just what's going on in life. And we'll get to that. So what about this chronic pain? First thing is, there's a genetic background. It turns out that there's a strong familial predisposition. They have what's called an odds ratio of greater than eight. That means you're eight times more likely to have chronic pain if someone in your family has chronic pain. So if you have someone who has fibromyalgia or has low back pain or has pain that they just have, you have a higher probability. It's clearly familial. And it turns out that we've we found some genes that are associated with it, actually related. And these are three genes. They're not particularly important as what the names are, except one of them relates to serotonin. And you'll hear more about serotonin. And there's a genetic predisposition to pain because the serotonin gene is abnormal in many people. Or catecholamines. Anybody know what catecholamines are? Name one, anybody. Epinephrine. Norepinephrine. Adrenaline. Those are catecholamines. So there is a genetic predisposition to some abnormality in our adrenaline when we have chronic pain. So there are genes that are very common and that will help us treat that we found relating to chronic pain. And there's more to it than that. This is a very interesting study. What they took is they took some normal patients, normal people, who are males and females, always good. In LA, you gotta be careful. They could be either one or neither. Or but we're assuming these are the normal nor males and females. And they gave them all 800 milligrams of Advil. And interestingly enough, the women had more difficulty. They didn't get the same response. They just didn't get as much response compared to the placebo, whereas the men did. So there is a difference in gender predisposition to response to pain meds. And it's harder on women. Women don't respond as well to some of the standard medicines. Okay? It's not they're crazy. It's not that, oh, you're just a woman. There's a real reason between, uh, uh, for this. So what about triggers? And there are a lot of them. Here are some of them. And some of you who have had chronic pain or have it might recall some of this. Infections including viral infections, which are some of them. Not the usual, you know, cold, but viral infections. Automobile accidents, falling in the tub. Really getting under stress. You know, there are lots of things that are very stressful in life. For example, unfortunately, divorces, kids, losing a job. Those are among the three of the 10 highest stresses that people go on, under, undergo. That can cause it. Of course, menopause, thyroid problems, and never forget that when you suddenly get pains, think about all the medicines you're on, because some of them can do that. And I find frequently, well, not frequently, but certainly at times, the way I deal with it is I stop some of the medicines, and they go away. So remember that. I always tell every one of my patients, you never get something for nothing when it comes to medicines. And so you may get pains from them. Vaccines can cause them. And certain 
catastrophic events. Interestingly enough, not if there's an earthquake or a flood, but if there's a war. We don't have to deal with that at least for the last 200 years, right? And then there are psychological triggers. And some of the triggers help us prevent more pain. If we feel control over the pain, that helps us minimize it. If we have a supportive spouse or friends or a pet, getting support helps minimize the pain. Knowing what to expect. You know, living with a pain that you never know is going to get better or worse, not a good idea. So knowing where it comes from and knowing what to expect, in one case called directionality, it's coming from my brain, it's coming from my leg, or it's going to happen every time I have a period or every time I sleep badly or something like that, helps control it because you know what to expect. So those are psychological stresses that you can actually deal with sometimes because if you know what's going on, you can help decrease the pain. And th there's a relationship between the psychological factors and various body factors. So if you think about this little mouse, not a happy camper, okay? She's, I assume it's a she, I have no idea. I haven't looked. Um, and sitting in a, in a life preserver, in cold water, not looking good, okay? So there's psychological stress. She's sitting there, not happy. But there's also physiologic stress. She's in water, not something she likes. And on top of that, she could have bad genes, right? Those three together can develop symptoms. And when you get symptoms, one of the things that happens is you can have, you kind of withdraw, you get away from people, you don't sleep well because it hurts. It bothers you. And sometimes you can do things that actually make it worse. For example, um, you can avoid going out. And so now you're more isolated. And what happens then is you get more symptoms. And round and round it goes. So you have physical and physiologic problems made worse by all sorts of things that happen in life. So what was done was they looked at about 100 fibromyalgia patients, chronic pain patients, and there were three groups. One, who had very low depression. They weren't very tender. They were not people who made it worse. Catastrophizing. It's a loaded word, but what it means is that you feel like you have this pain and it's never going to go away, ever. Okay, That's called catastrophizing, because most of the time, pain gets better for some time. And it's never the same all the time. But thinking that it's the worst it could possibly be, never going to ever get, a bit, get better, that's catastrophizing. And they have a feeling of moderate control over that pain. So those people, their psychological factors are basically neutral. And if that's true, that is not depressed, not terribly tender, not thinking, oh my God, the worst that's going to happen is going to continue happening, and of a feeling of control, then other things than psychological factors can be dealt with. And then there are the group that's very tender, that is depressed, that really thinks, oh, God, this is never going to end, and therefore I have no control over anything. Those are the people whose symptoms are made worse by psychological factors. That's important, because if we deal with the psychological factors and we accept those as real, we are likely to get better control over the pain. And then the, the group that may be really tender, not depressed, not catastrophizing, with a high degree of feeling, I'm going to control this, in which you actually help them use their psychological factors to improve their symptoms. So right now, some folks with bad chronic pain, if we can get them to look at themselves, and some of you may have it, look at yourselves and say, all right, 
I'm a, a person who's going to need a little help psychologically. Or, you know what? Not to worry. I'll just use other things than psychological factors. Because remember that big green circle at the beginning? Most people have some degree of psychological problems with it. What about the mechanisms? Now, this is some of the new stuff. And I, I got to tell you, this is exciting, really exciting. What they have here is a functional MRI. And it, what it does is if, if the brain is metabolically active, an area lights up. Okay? The green areas are essentially normal. And the red areas are people with, with chronic pain syndromes. And you can see that people with chronic pain syndromes have areas of their brain that light up more than people who don't. There's a physical thing going on here. Okay, it's not just in your head. Well, of course it is, but it's physically in your head. And more exciting than anything else, I found this really remarkable. There's something called connectivity. What they do, they do EEGs. And they look at the areas of the brain and see if an area in the EEG, the encephalogram, the brain recording, lights up. If you do it in this area, then does it light up in this area? And there are people who have lots more connections than other people. And the people who have lots of connections, more pain. More connectivity, more brain. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? You light up this area, but in fact, the whole brain lights up. And if you don't have that, that's called reduced coherence. If you do have it, that's called coherence. And you can see here, if you look at the fibro impact questionnaire, and you look at pain, those who have little of this connection have less pain, about 40% less. And those who have a lot more don't get that much response. And the difference between those two is significant. So it says not only do varying parts of the brain light up, but the more parts light up, the more likely there'll be real problems dealing with the pain. So what does that mean? Well, we're not going to cut out parts of your brain. Sorry about that. We're not there yet. But it does give us a handle on how to measure a change in a given individual, which can help us when we try and treat them. So, most people, when they're exposed to something that's painful, getting hit or whatever, have a certain threshold where it says, you know, now this is painful. Did a wonderful study with medical students. They, they actually lifted them up, okay, about this much. And they didn't tell them when, but they dropped them sometime. Minute, second, okay. And the patients who, when they dropped, had more pain, had increasing amount of more pain. So what happened is they decreased their noxious threshold. They felt more pain to the same amount of, of stimulus. Decreased noxious threshold. Not just the pressure. It could be anything. Heat, noise, okay? Even just touch. And you can see that in the brain. So what you see here is on the vertical axis, there's more and more pain as you move up. And on the horizontal axis, the amount of stimulus to cause the pain. And if you look at a green, the person who doesn't have this, it takes a certain amount of pain to get a pain level of 11. But if you look at a patient with chronic pain, it takes less than half that much to get the same amount of pain. See that? What's, and what's happening is there are physical things going on. You see all these different, seven different proteins 
that normally cause the pain. Okay, and it doesn't matter what they are, but there are a bunch of them. And in patients with fibromyalgia, they're higher than normals. This is one of them called substance P. And you can see that patients with fibromyalgia, this is four different studies, those are the authors, substance P is higher in the cerebral spinal fluid than patients without the chronic pain. Then there are things that cut off the pain. Remember we talked about epinephrine, adrenaline, norepinephrine is one of them. And we talked about serotonin and those genes. And in some people, there's less of it. So you got more pain coming in, less suppression of pain going out. So you're going to have more pain, right? So what happens is this. As you increase the pain, there's sort of a, a curve it's to the right here, which says this is normal pain. And people who have the chronic pain, who have the more connectivity, the more co coherence, who, who have this issue of increased noxious threshold or decreased noxious threshold, they get what's called hyperalgesia. That means the normal amount of pressure causes more pain. So you move right on down. And so something that before you started this would just, you know, you stubbed your toe. Now you stub your toe and it hurts for three days. Right? So now how do you recognize you as a person recognize when there's central pain going on? We've talked about the causes of it, the triggers. So now what do we begin to do about it? First, we have to diagnose it. First, we need to realize that some of that pain simply isn't accounted for by what we would expect. So you have a bump, and there's more pain than you, you, you ought to have. You know this. And it's not in the places you expect. You hit the arm. And before long, you hit this spot, the whole arm hurts. And then the back hurts, but you only hit this place. So it's pain in a lot more places than you'd expect. And, you know, you don't need much and it hurts. I've had so many of my patients say, you know, when my husband touches me, it hurts. Didn't used to. <laughs> oh, you wouldn't have married him. And then you don't respond to the usual peripheral medications, including narcotics. And then you get these additional things. Brain fog. You just can't think. You're just tired. You wake up tired. You sleep six hours. You wake up unrefreshed. And then you just feel lousy. Look, everyone has some of these symptoms. And having a few of them is completely normal. It doesn't mean if you have some of these that you have central pain. But if you have a lot of them and it's just ongoing, think about central pain. So what do you do about it? There are things you can do that don't involve medications. Aerobic exercises. Well, you know, sometimes that's hard to do. But sometimes you have to work through the pain. Now notice it's aerobic exercises. Not, surprisingly, stretching. It doesn't work. I thought it did until I read the literature. It doesn't do the job, but aerobic exercises work. We'll go a little bit more into it. Then there's pharmacology. We'll talk about that. And then there are alternative therapies that I also want to mention, and something called cognitive behavioral therapy, and we'll talk about that as well. So exercise. It helps. And I'll bet you, well, let me ask the question. How many of you have gone to physical therapy and been told to exercise? Raise your hands. Me too, okay? 
How many of you were still doing it six months later? There you go. The hardest problem with something that works like this is keep on doing it because it is boring. There are days you get up and say, you've got to be kidding. I'm just not up to this. So the hardest part of rob about exercising and aerobic exercising is doing it. And remember that because well done, double blind, controlled studies have shown that it works. So sometimes you just do it, even if you don't want to. You think of it as a drug. It's just as important as drugs. When do you start it? Well, you start it, generally speaking, a little after the other therapies. But I've got to tell you honestly, I tell a lot of my patients to do it before because I don't like drugs. And if it works, fantastic, then you don't need the drugs. But it's politically correct to do it after. So sometimes we're not politically correct. Okay? And, you know, particularly your physical therapist sees you and wants to make you an Olympic athlete. Not going to happen. Okay? What you need to do is you start with five minutes. Not jumping jacks, something that doesn't shock the system. And you build up. I tell my patients, if you can start at five minutes, in two months, if you can get to 15 minutes, you're doing great. And it's more than, oh, well, it's just exercise. This is important stuff. Okay? And if you talk about strengthening and stretching, just as I mentioned, it, it just, the data are just not very good. Well, about some of these medicines. Well, one of the medicines affects getting from the, from the um, spinal column to the brain. They're called tricyclics, among many others. And this is an example of most of those medicines. And the ones that work best are the mixed ones. Remember those genes, serotonin and catecholamines? It's both of those genes that these medicines affect. The mixed one affect both. Some of them affect serotonin, some are nor norepinephrine. So for example, um, Paxil, Prozac, those are serotonins. Nortriptyline, there's no other name for it. Desipramine, no other name for those. Mostly norepinephrine. Isn't it interesting that nortriptyline and amitriptyline, they look like, they, if you look at them chemically, they're darn near the same. They don't have the same effect. Amitriptyline works both ways, nortriptyline does not. So when your doctor says try amitriptyline, that's good news. Nortriptyline, less likely. And then there are stuff like venlafaxine, oh Lord, sertraline, not Sertler, Venlafaxin, what is it? Effexor, Duloxetine, Cymbalta, Milnociparam, Savella. Those are drugs that hit both, and are, if we're going to use them, that's the way to use them. Now, how do we use them? Well, don't take 25 milligram tablets and just take them. You take 10 milligram tablets, and you split them in half and you build up very slowly. Because if you do it all at once, all you'll get are the side effects and you won't have the time for the effects. It takes two to three weeks before it begins to kick in and it has to be the right dose. So basically you have to work your way up to the right dose. Start slow, go low. Okay? Now look, not everybody responds immediately to the first medicine they use. Wish we understood that, but we don't. And so you may have to add additional medicines with different mechanisms of action. And then you may need to use some medicines that work differently on the spinal column, like Neurontin or Lyrica or Tramadol. So you have to use a mix and match approach. Don't forget non-pharmacological, such as these. Acupuncture. Look, for these, there's not a lot of evidence. 
but to a large degree, they don't do any harm. So it's worth a try. Acupuncture has been shown to work for all sorts of pain, if you believe in it. It's remarkable. I went to China, and there are people who are getting acupuncture for their gallbladder surgery because they knew it worked, and so it worked. So the power of the mind is remarkable, and I think you have to take advantage of that. So if you go into this and you say acupuncture, ah, eh, nonsense. It's unlikely to do much. If you think it might work, then it kind of adds up and might work. Myofascial release. <sighs> Boy, is there no data for that. It's like stretching, but painful. Okay, so I, I'm not sure that's, there's much data for that. Trigger point injections, yes. Sometimes with water, sometimes with lidocaine, sometimes with steroids. The point is, break up those muscle tense points. And I have a lot of my patients who come in every three weeks, I do three or four of them, they go home, they're happy campers. So those data, not so much. Chiropractic, also useful if the person isn't trying to cure your whole scleroderma. Okay, it can help the pain. And biofeedback works for about 70% of people. Both relaxation and for Raynaud's temperature. And there are data to support that, actually. What about this? Cognitive behavioral therapy, very fancy way of saying teach. Okay? What, what, what you do is you get information, you process it, think about it, and sometimes it helps because you're thinking about it, you understand it. Remember we were talking about understanding where the pain comes from? That's part of this. Okay? And it does help. You can deal with it better even if you have the pain you can get rid of some of the things that are sort of against you. Sometimes sort of this feeling of it's going to go on forever. Okay? It works for most things, but it certainly also works for scleroderma. The problem is finding the right person. And good luck with that. You just have to ask your friends. You have to try several. Okay? If you do that, you're very likely to get some help from this, right? So what we've done in, I was four minutes too fast, gives us a little more time to talk. We've talked about anatomically defined pain and we've talked about the, the 800 pound gorilla in the room, which is the non-anatomically um, defined pain. We know it's genetical, it's genetics, yeah, sorry, it's genetic, it's not just in your head, so to speak. We know there are real triggers that you can dig out and find that started this. We know there's a relationship between the pain, what's going on in the brain, and we can show it. We know that when that happens, the whole pain sensorium gets more sensitive, and so normal quote unquote, pain becomes more painful. And we know there are significant numbers of treatments, many of which don't require medications. But most of the time, because if you look at those, those pictures of going from wherever the pain started through the, brain, through the spinal cord to the brain, it's very complicated. Most of the time you have to do more than one. So a combination is what's going to work. All right? So that's what I had to say, and now we have a little time for questions. Thank you very much. When I need I'm sorry, to, tr tramadol? I take tramadol, yep. and there's so much controversy about that. I exercise, too, every day. I, do all, I take hot baths. I, I do everything, but I have to take tramadol, too. How, how addicting is that? Because I hear from one doctor, ah, take all you need. One doctor, no. So what is the skivvy on that? <laughs> okay. That's a good, good question. Uh, 
it has some opioid characteristics like Vicodin or nar nar Norco and things like that, but much less than most. There, is, there really are some significant data about this. There are addictive personalities, and there are non-addictive personalities. If you're the kind of person who, generally speaking, says, you know, I need more because I want no pain at all, and damn it, I'm going to have no pain at all, and you keep going more, that's the kind of person who tends to get used to these medicines. Not a good idea. But there are a lot of people who underuse the medicines. They're told to use it twice a day. They use it once every third day. They're not going to get addicted. So you have to be aware of the kind of person you are. And if you're the kind of person who tends to get dependent on medicines, you've got to be careful about tramadol. If you're the kind of person who isn't, it's quite safe. Just keep watch. If you start on twice a day and three months later you're on four a day, that's a hint. But if you're on twice a day and two years later you're still on twice a day, I don't care what they say. Okay? I have a lot of my patients who are on, quote, narcotics. And they've been on the same dose of narcotic for 10 years. They are not addicted. Okay? So it really depends on what you are. And you know deep inside what you are. Okay. The, re the, the comment is, as long as you take it to take the edge off. Well, it depends on you as a person. But that's right. That's one way to do it. Okay? Other questions? I've never heard of the trigger point injections. Do those work also for the tendon pain? Uh, that's a great question. So tendon pain comes from many different things. Just relax. I'll, okay. I'll answer. Um, one of the causes of tendon pain are inflammation in the tendons, tendonitis. And that can be treated with injections very irregularly. Those of you who have ever had that kind of creakiness in the morning that you can hear, creak, creak, right? That's a tendon friction rub. That's inflammation. That can be treated with a little steroid, in fact, or ultrasound through the, through the skin. Data? Forget it. This is data free. OK? Now, if you have trigger points, which which usually isn't on the tendons anyway, it's around the tendons. That can be treated repeatedly, but you've got to be careful when it comes to tendons. Right? You don't do this, of course, but you can't have your doctor inject into a tendon. First, it'll hurt like the very dickens, and second, it can destroy the tendon. Not so good. So when you do things around tendons, your doctor has to be very careful. Okay? And if it hurts a lot, you got to speak up right now. Okay? Yeah. And as I say, I frequently, when it's very superficial and it's tendonitis, I go and send them, depending where it is, to a physical therapist or occupational therapist and give them a steroid cream, which doesn't get systemic, and use ultrasound to drive it into the skin. It only gets in a couple of millimeters. But if the problem is right at the, at the front, like it is over the ankles, it can work very well. So it's my understanding that with the chronic pain syndrome, there's something that starts this cascade, I guess you would say. So like maybe we're diagnosed with the scleroderma and it's like the arthritis pain that we get that then maybe starts this chronic pain syndrome, and then we have an, um, the so you have irrational pain, pain response then, and that's why we continue to be in chronic pain. Is that the I think that's very reasonable. Look, much of the time, the pain starts somewhere. You've fallen. You have an autoimmune disease. And then it spreads to be more than, quote, unquote, just that area. It, becomes the chronic pain syndrome. So that doesn't happen to everyone, and it doesn't go on forever necessarily, but that's the, the idea, that all of us who have these problems that just go on can develop chronic pain. So is diagnosis scleroderma 
probably five and a half years ago. And then I have Renaud's and I also have fibromyalgia. That just came about maybe about a year ago. My son has all these special needs. So are we, what I'm taking from this is thinking that the stress from my son's special needs is maybe what has pushed forth the fibromyalgia. I'm a little confused, if you can explain that a little more. Okay, so the, the onset of the chronic pain can be brought on by multiple different stresses, be it falling or a family situation that's incredibly difficult. But you have the scleroderma, yeah. but you got something in addition, lucky right. you, and consequently, you're gonna have this secondary pain. And sometimes you can do something about it, and sometimes you can't, and if you can't do something about the cause of that chronic pain, then you have to do whatever you can to deal with the symptoms of the chronic pain. All right, well thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>